uh, Gustavo Gutierrez, Theology of Liberation, uh, Major Theological Themes, uh, Part 1. Uh, all the bibliographic information, once again here, and all the page uh, page numbers, in particular all the quotes of the page numbers are through this uh, book, the Gustavo uh, Gutierrez Essential Writings. This is the same book as it's on the uh, picture. Uh, it's the same pagination, everything, just a different cover. Again, I highly recommend this collection of uh, writings. <clears throat> We'll start with the uh, preferential option for the poor, maybe uh, the phrase Gutierrez is most uh, famous for, in addition to uh, the liberation theology. Um, with regard to his famous phrase about the need to exercise a preferential option for the poor, uh, Gutierrez, as is the case throughout his work, uh, distinguishes himself through the precision and comprehensiveness with which he unfolds his concepts. He analyzes each term in detail. First, poor. Uh, he unfolds three distinct meanings of poor, or poverty. Uh, first, there is poverty, which exposes one immediately to the threat of death. Uh, and he thinks of this both in terms of physical death and cultural death. And here he has in view the death of the indigenous cultures in Peru, um, and of course elsewhere. Uh, second, there is economic, social, um, and, and political dimensions uh, to poverty. Uh, not only financial need and stress, uh, but the lack of power or influence, access to edu education, uh, access to culture, um, act and a lack of access, uh, a lack of access to education, a lack of access to culture, and a lack of voice in one's society. These are all forms of poverty, and it's good to index all of these because these are all the sorts of poverty that we would need to liberate people uh, from. Uh, and third, in a different biblical sense, which is positive, uh, he speaks of spiritual poverty, which is identified with humility and openness to the loving spirit of God. In addition, and this is an important qualification, it is easy to neglect if one has been raised uh, and speaks from a position of privilege, he argues that those who are impoverished have a great richness to contribute. Uh, this is not to recommend poverty. Uh, he does not romanticize poverty. Uh, but it is to counter the sort of cultural, societal uh, impoverishment that results when mainstream perspectives uh, do not recognize that ho those who are impoverished may, uh, by virtue of either their native uh, talents or as a result of insights and sensitivities which spring from seeing society from the underside, uh, they have unique and valuable insights to contribute. Indeed, since those who are impoverished or marginalized often have to speak both the language of dominant groups, uh, which is most likely distorted since it is formulated only by those uh, who are not impoverished. Um, and they also have to speak the language that makes sense from the perspective of those who are impoverished. Um, then there is something to the contention that those who are marginalized are in better a better position uh, wholly to understand all the complexities of a culture, a better, a better position than those who are mainstream, simply because of necessity, they have to be able to negotiate and speak uh, in various vocabularies and languages, see the culture from various perspectives. Uh, significantly, Gutierrez is careful to stress that he does not number himself among the poor. Uh, though he was raised in poverty, his clerical connections allowed him to gain access to an elite education, um, and, as, and as a priest, he has a position of respect and is part of a wealthy global entity, uh, the Roman Catholic Church. And then Gutierrez is careful to add a, a final comment about poverty. Um, if you talk about the poor, people will probably regard you as sensitive and generous. But if you talk about the causes of poverty, they will say to themselves, is this a Christian speaking? Isn't such language really political? The power of this resistance is, I think, visible when one realizes the degree to which, uh, when one hears about diversity or oppression, poverty in the sense of economic class is often not even mentioned. Uh, I have seen all sorts of questionnaires and surveys about diversity which make no reference at all to economic class, uh, even as a multitude of other factors are delineated. Uh, similarly, uh, many progressives appear to distance themselves from liberation theology 
in Gutierrez's economic sense. Um, on the other hand, uh, when he was assassinated, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. was about to go to Washington to initiate his Poor People's Campaign, which explicitly included all people who were impoverished. Uh, this is a mantle which has now been picked up by the Reverend William Barber II. In addition, one of Black Liberation's, uh, uh, liberation theologian James Cohn's early books was God of the Oppressed, Again, a reference to all who find themselves marginalized um, and oppressed. And recently we witnessed the nationwide, if rapidly marginalized and now bereft, Occupy Wall Street uh, movement, to which Cornell West, among others, gave uh, strong support. Finally, preferential, in terms of preferential option for the poor, uh, well, not finally, but secondly, does not preferential does not mean God loves poor people more, but but it imagines how a God who loves all equally would have us regard a full a world full of unequal suffering and poverty. As I mentioned uh, in my last videotape, it may be helpful to think in terms of medical triage here, uh, where in an emergency in an emergency context, one gives preferential treatment to those with the most life-threatening injuries. In terms of how we should direct our works of mercy in this world, in fidelity to the love which is the manifestation of our faith, equal love where there is unequal um, uh, unequal oppression, I don't know why it says unequal energy, but it shouldn't say, unequal need maybe, suggests a need for preferential treatment of those in the greatest need. This is not then unequal love or a claim that God does not love those who are living in relative security, or even those who are well-off, or even oppressors. Uh, and it does not mean that we should not love all graciously, but amidst the inequalities of our unequal world, preferential attention results from equal love. Now, now finally, uh, option is important to stress, he says, because we are free to harden our hearts, uh, to act as the goats did in the parable of the sheep and the goats. Uh, we are free to ignore those who are impoverished or impressed. We need consciously to choose to notice, to attend to, to help the poor. And since the mainstream perspective uh, presupposed in the preceding sentence would be easy for those of us who are relatively privileged not to notice, Gutierrez also stresses that the poor themselves must choose to opt for the poor, uh, for others who are poor, or for justice, even for themselves. This is essential to stress in order to respect the agency of those who are impoverished. He also stresses that those who are poor or impoverished are not to be romanticized, as if they are a wholly homogenous group, or as if some individuals who are impoverished are not any better or worse than others. He says that when he hears people romanticize those who are poor, he has the distinct impression they have not actually known many people who are poor. Before moving on, let's just note that when he defines liberation in depth, which I'm not sure he does in the readings we'll be considering here, of course what he's doing, liberation is in response to the term development, but it also is uh, in response to um, a spiritual understanding of salvation, an exclusively spiritual understanding of salvation. Uh, Gutierrez affirms the spiritual understanding of salvation, but salvation should also be working for liberation, uh, and liberation should be worked for with regard to all the forms of poverty uh, just mentioned. They should all be taken into account. So that's where the richness of his discussion of poverty uh, and the preferential option uh, and preferential of option, but especially of the different forms of poverty, uh, can be helpful as we think of the a comprehensive way uh, to think about uh, salvation and works of mercy in the world. Now, according to Gutierrez, theology is intellectual reflection upon a commitment, uh, the commitment of faith, which is love of God and neighbor. So the central issue is charity, commitment, action in the world. Uh, this is from an essay toward a theology of liberation from 1968, which is uh, three, three years before his book, the famous seminal text, The Theology of Liberation, um, is published. And here again, like Wesley, for Gutierrez, the essence of faith is not affirmation of some particular belief or theology, but the living out of a commitment, namely commitment to love. 
as Gutierrez says, this way of expressing concretely the emphases of the parable of the lost sheep, uh, when did we feed, clothe, comfort, visit you in prison, whenever you did the least of these, you did it to me, um, and the parable of the Good Samaritan, go and do likewise, um, and putting faithful performance um, in, in response to the call of Jesus, um, uh, um, here again, Wesley, I've lost the, the thread here, here again, Gutierrez, like Wesley, puts these works of mercy at the forefront of our understanding of what it is to be living faith. Theology, then, is reflection upon the dynamics of living out this commitment to love of neighbor, which is love of God. Uh, this is the sense in which he would interpret Anselm's famous definition of faith-seeking understanding. Beliefs and the formulations of, of theology are important, but faith, commitment to love, comes first. And beliefs and theology are more true and helpful or more false and a hindrance insofar as they facilitate or hinder works of love. This emphasis upon works of love leads him to tie tightly the idea of a Messiah and the overcoming of oppression and injustice. When we struggle for a just world in which there is no servitude, oppression, or slavery, uh, uh, Gutierrez says, uh, we are signifying the coming of the Messiah. An intimate relationship exists between the kingdom and the elimination of poverty and misery. It is striking that this call for justice can strike many as radical, for it is merely another way of saying, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, and understanding that sincere saying of that prayer commits one not merely to a pious wish, but to concrete action that will help ensure God's will will indeed be done on earth. In fact, however, and considering the biblical record of societal response to the prophets, uh, which is hostile, right? Uh, this should be no surprise, the resistance to what Gutierrez is saying. Um, Gutierrez's contention that Christian commitment entails concrete struggle for social justice led to him being attacked for being a Marxist, a communist. Um, these charges were so serious during the Cold War um, that they resulted in the assassination of many Christians who engaged seriously in struggles for social reform in Latin America, uh, most famously the 1980 murder of Archbishop Oscar Romero of San Salvador, El Salvador, um, as he was celebrating Mass with other victims, his friends, and parishioners. The deadly association of Gutierrez and liberation theologians with Marx and communism was so prevalent in North America and Europe uh, that Christians and even non-Christians among the general public who were teens or adults in the 1970s are likely to have an immediate negative reaction towards liberation theology. Uh, this, it is important to stress, is to be caught up, perhaps unwittingly, but nonetheless to be caught up in the sort of anti-prophetic fervor which led to the death of prophets and indeed uh, to the murder of Jesus. And note that no one killed Jesus so that he could save us. The considerable energies necessary to provoke the killing were generated because of the concrete socio-political threat that Jesus' call for peace, love, and justice posed to political and economic elites. To realize how mistaken it was to simply condemn Gutierrez as a Marxist, uh, consider what Gutierrez explicitly says about Marx in this essay, which was written, well, in 1968, three years before the publication of his Theology of Liberation. Uh, so, so that book, we realize in retrospect, was in part the realized fruit of this effort to work towards a new method. First, uh, and here, Gutierrez, uh, uh, here is Gutierrez citing and then commenting upon Marx on religion from Karl Marx. Uh, this is him quoting Marx. The social principles of Christianity preach the need of a dominating class and an oppressed class, and to the latter class they offer only the benevolence of the ruling class. The social benevolence, uh, the social principles of Christianity point to heaven as compensation for all the crimes that are committed on earth. This is a, a variation of his opiate of the people uh, opium with people line that he develops elsewhere, Marx does. Uh, the social principles of Christianity explain all the viciousness of oppressors as a just punishment, either for original sin or other sins, or as trials that the Lord in infinite wisdom inflicts on those the Lord has redeemed. The social principles of Christianity preach cowardice, self-hatred, servility, submission, humility, in a word, all the characteristics of a, sco of a scoundrel. <clears throat> 
Gutierrez cites this quote and then claim, exclaims with incredulity, how could Marx have presented such an image of Christianity? To make clear just how directly Marx misrepresents Christian teaching, um, and we might add Jewish teaching, in response, Gutierrez directly cites a passage of scripture, one of a multitude he could have chosen. He cites the Jewish prophet Isaiah. Uh, For behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered and come into mind. That is, the former things will not be remembered because sociopolitical reality would be so different that no one would remember the unjust structures of the past, right? That's what this is talking about. But be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create, for behold, I create Jerusalem rejoicing. No more shall be heard in it the sound of weeping and the cry of distress, or an old man who does not fill out his days. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For like the days of a tree shall the days of my people be, and my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. How, Gutierrez asked soberly, could this have been transformed into what was described in the text of Marx? Unfortunately, Gutierrez immediately makes clear there is indeed an answer to this question, for it turns out that both the picture of of Isaiah and the picture of Marx are true from different perspectives. For while Isaiah represents true Jewish and Christian proclamation, Marx, writing in London a century after Wesley, when the dramatic changes went by the Industrial Revolution have dramatically worsened the working condition of impoverished men, women, and children across England, in that context, Marx accurately describes brutal injustice, which continues to be repeated by human beings today, um, Gutierrez adds. The issue, Gutierrez concludes, is whether we are capable of realizing the prophecy of Isaiah and of understanding the kingdom of God and its integral reality, or whether we are going to give the counter-testimony that is reflected in the statements of Marx. This is precisely what is at stake in our epic. epic. In other words, are we as the Church of Jesus Christ in our teaching and mission going to work to realize the vision of the prophets and of Jesus, or are we going to perpetuate pseudo-Christian teachings which betray or ignore the gospel, which make every recitation of the Lord's Prayer on earth as it is in heaven into the toothless mouthing of a pious wish? Ironically, those who simply condemn Gutierrez as Marxist in the coming decades after this publication of his book are revealed to be themselves those who, insofar as they seek to suppress Gutierrez's prophetic um, and gospel call to prove us Marx wrong by working to ensure God's will might be on earth as in heaven, uh, they would condemn Christianity by proving Marx's damning claims. It is they who, in fact, work work to validate Marx by resisting Gutierrez and his broadened call for liberation, while Gutierrez passionately seeks, through faithful witness and action, to falsify Marx's claims in fidelity to the call of Isaiah and the life and teachings of Jesus. Not only is Gutierrez's theology of liberation not Marxist then, it is expressly designed to falsify Marx's devastating claims about Christianity, about religion. Now, it must be said that Gutierrez is informed by Marx's utopian ideals, and in particular by Marx's critique of the inequities generated by unregulated capitalism. Marx famously dreamed of a world in which we would live out the ideal of from each according to their ability, to each according to their need. This paints a beautiful picture of a utopia, but it, together with other significant convictions of Marx about the malleability and and native goodness of people, is so naive and false to the world that it is little surprise that Marx's states rapidly developed into totalitarian horrors. As a Christian theologian, I would say that Marx was devastatingly lacking in Christianity's hyper-realistic affirmation that we live in a fallen world, Um, nor does Marx have any idea, again, hyper-realistic Christian affirmation of original sin. But, like Gutierrez appears to do, we can accept Marx's critiques of capitalism 
um, and, and how, how it tends to generate uh, inequities w without significant regulation while rejecting his dangerously naive utopianism. In the introduction to his commentary on the book of Job, Gutierrez unpacks the relationship between revelation and gratuitousness and between silence and practice. With regard to the relationship between revelation and gratuitousness, Gutierrez cites numerous scripture passages that suggest God hides, hid, or hides the gospel from the wise and experts and revealed, reveals it preferentially to the simple. Since there is no inherent merit in ignorance, Gutierrez says, uh, nor are simple people necessarily humble or moral, uh, God's preferential love for the poor is not the result of merit, uh, Gutierrez uh, concludes, but it is gratuitous. Now, while I have taken pains to defend Gutierrez's preferential option for the poor in terms of medical triage, here I think Gutierrez slips into a different and problematic version of God's preferential love for the poor. Uh, for example, when he says, the scorned of this world are those whom the God who is loved prefers. Um, in this way of phrasing it, I think critics are right uh, to, criticizing, uh, to criticize. Uh, his phrasing here suggests, contrary to what he says elsewhere, not the triage dynamic, where equal love manifests unequally in unequal contexts, but a divine preference, preference for those who are poor and simple just straight away. Now, this problematic uh, suggestion that God's love is directly preferential in fact, not just in effect in relation to circumstances, may not be what Gutierrez intends to be saying here. Perhaps it is simply poor phrasing or an issue with translation. Um, and the best argument for concluding that Gutierrez could not possibly have meant to suggest that the God of love straightforwardly prefer, prefers the poor and simple is because that would directly contradict his emphasis upon the gratuitous love of God, a gracious love which takes no account of merit, um, even if poor is being counted as merit. Uh, the scandal of the gospel in this respect is gracious, God's gracious love for enemies. Uh, which names not personal enemies, they may be personal enemies, but it's, that's not the point. The point is that they're enemies of what is good. God's gracious love for enemies includes gracious love for those who oppress and do evil. Perhaps Gutierrez is, or could, suggest that it is the poor and simple who are most open to the gospel, most likely to discern its gratuitous character, because their marginalization helps them to discern the violence and falsity of any wholesale social meritocratic valuation of life. Um, uh, an understanding that suggests that merit material access, or, you know, I'm rich or I'm poor, and it's completely because of merit. Uh, those who are poor in a good position uh, to understand that that is not um, not true. Uh, while merit or demerit often plays some role in one's fortunes, um, and exceptional circumstances may play a very large role um, in exceptional cases providing beloved uh, pulling oneself up by one's own bootstraps examples. Um, on the whole, people's fortunes are overwhelmingly dictated by the circumstances uh, they find themselves thrown into, the place, their place in the flow of history, um, into which they simply find themselves thrown by birth. Uh, some who are wealthy or well-educated or famous do indeed realize the degree to which they are in large part lucky. Uh, but especially for those who are proud and want to justify their superiority or privilege by thinking of it wholly as a product of their superior merit, for them it will be far more difficult to discern and affirm the gratu gratuitous love uh, which embraces all without regard to merit. This would understand the advantage of the poor to result from the ways in which they are more likely to be open to gratuitous love. So the preference is related not to divine favoritism, but to ways various circumstances render one more or less likely to set aside pride and self-justification and to be open to grounding and affirming oneself above all as the child of gracious love. This would be consistent with how Gutierrez elsewhere explains the preferential option for the poor, and it is consistent with what he declares here is the free and unmerited love of God for every human being. I mean, that sentence is right in the middle of this. That's a reason to think that there's, that's just a lack of clarity here. Uh, this way of understanding the preference would also be in accord with the predominant traditional understanding of the radical gratuity of Jesus's love your enemy, 
Pray for those who persecute you. Turn the other cheek. Forgive them. They know not what they do. All of this is also consistent with Gutierrez's contention at other points that liberation liberates both the oppressed and the oppressor. I think the most generous move here is to acknowledge uh, that Gutierrez's phrasing is problematic, uh, but to note that it runs contrary not only to the gratuitousness he himself stresses here, but that it also runs contrary to many of his other writings and to interpret his meaning, um, and, and so we should interpret his meaning in as generous a fashion as is possible. Now, after discussion the relationship, discussing the relation between gratuitousness and revelation, uh, Gutierrez moves to discuss the connection between silence and speech. And here, too, we see a striking similarity to Wesley, for silence for Gutierrez is not simply the still silence of the Moravians. Uh, for Gutierrez, silence includes two mutually reinforcing, feed each other, he says, dimensions, contemplation and practice, which he says we do when we do God's will and allow God to reign. This contemplation and practice appears to mirror the way in which Wesley integrates works of mercy and means of grace, prayer, meditation, sacraments, uh, into the core spiritual practices of his United Societies. Um, again, I do not think uh, Gutierrez is directly influenced by Wesley, uh, but at many points we will find uh, that their understanding of faith um, is remarkably uh, similar. Uh, Gutierrez strikes a note similar to Schleiermacher when he says, in prayer we remain speechless, we simply place ourselves before God. Um, this is very much the sort of prayer Schleiermacher sees Jesus epitomize at Gethsemane, where the purpose even of the words is to be fully honest and present to God as we open ourselves to be transformed uh, by the Spirit of God. In this sense, uh, Gutierrez says, often the most profound spiritual communion between two people occurs after words have ceased. Uh, perhaps there is only embrace, a touch of the hand, uh, sitting silently in vigil at the bedside or by the coffin or by the phone. Um, and often our purest acts of love, works of mercy, happen uh, without a thought. Uh, we see those physically, emotionally, or spiritually wounded, and immediately, like the sheep, like the Samaritan, we reach out and render aid and comfort. This is silence as contemplation and practice, which feed each other in opening to the Spirit of God, action in, ad in, in abidance, in immediate reaction to that Spirit of love, which then feeds our openness to the Spirit of God. Um, and both of them become before come before speech, that is, before theology, which thereby becomes uh, spe speech, he says, I'm quoting now, speech enriched by silence, the silence of, um, um, of um, um, uh, contemplation and practice. Now, of course, none of this should be run together um, with hostility or dismissiveness, obviously, towards reflection or theology. Um, all that we are reading, after all, is Gutierrez doing theology. And, and he is hoping that by his speech, by his theology here, uh, which has been informed by his silence, that is, by his contemplation and practice, uh, that, that, that through his theology he may reawaken, redirect us to silence, contemplation and practice, which should in turn nourish our own reflection and theology. Note here the, 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 the striking similarity to the dynamics that Wesley um, uh, unfolds as well. Now we're going to move to how he talks about truth and theology. We're going to see too this is tightly integrated with what we've been talking about. Um, I think what Gutierrez is responding to in this selection is an understanding of truth and of what it is to be a Christian which is too Greek, uh, and that's his term. Uh, Gutierrez explicitly affirms the Greek idea of truth. But when it comes to the essential Christian meaning of truth, he thinks our Greek way of thinking fosters a confused and anemic understanding of what it is to be Christian. Truth in the Greek sense, says Gutierrez, which is truth in the common modern scientific sense, names the correct relationship between an idea and a reality. Um, if I say this computer weighs two pounds, and you get a good scale, and it says the computer weighs two pounds, then my statement is true. The, the idea, the claim, corresponds to the reality. 
Now, there's nothing wrong with this idea of truth, uh, Gutierrez says, unless one uses it to understand what it is to be a Christian. Um, that is, unless one is led by this Greek way of thinking to think that Christian faith is believing that Jesus Christ is God incarnate, uh, who saves us from our sins or some such thing. Uh, that is, there is a problem if one thinks faith in the Christian sense should be understood in terms of truth in the Greek sense, such that to have faith is to believe some idea uh, or claim, uh, to believe some idea or claim uh, about Jesus Christ being God arcanate and so forth corresponds to reality. In this Greek sense, one would think that the answer to what is it to be Christian would be answered in terms of believing that some idea about reality is true. Answered in terms of believing some idea about reality is true. Jesus is God incarnate, died to save us from our sins, and so forth. Uh, this is not entirely wrong, but it is wholly insufficient. Uh, and the way it is insufficient, Gutierrez says, becomes clear if we consider the Hebrew way, the Semitic way of understanding truth. The Semitic way of understanding truth, Gutierrez argues, is focused on solidarity, fidelity, trustworthiness, loyalty, the relation between not uh, idea and reality, but between promise and fulfillment. Now, again, he is not denying that even the ancient Hebrews would have understood truth in the Greek sense. Um, if Eli asks Samuel, is it sunny out? And Samuel checks outside and comes back in and says, yes then Eli and Samuel have understood the question and answer in the Greek and modern scientific sense, and, and there's no problem with that. However, Gutierrez stresses, this is not the most significant way the Hebrew scriptures speak of truth, and not the main way we should understand truth in the theological sense. We retain a sense for what Gutierrez calls truth in the Semitic sense, um, and these are my examples now, to make his point. Uh, we retain a sense of what Gutierrez is calling truth in the Semitic sense when we speak of a true friend or a person who is true to their calling, true to their people, or true to their ideals. Again, as Gutierrez says, truth in this sense is focused upon solidarity, fidelity, trustworthiness, loyalty, the relation between promise and fulfillment. This is the sense, Gutierrez argues, in which we should hear Jesus claim that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. The Greek understanding pushes us to interpret this claim awkwardly, such that we could conclude that what Jesus is saying is that in order to come to the Father, we must hold as true some ideas about Jesus. That is, we must affirm a correlation between an idea and a reality so that faith becomes a form of knowledge or an affirmation of a truth, a a saying one believes something in the Greek sense. But Jesus, a, a Jew, uh, like the majority of his listeners, right, so thinking in the Semitic sense, is speaking of truth in the Semitic sense. So when he says he is the truth which leads to the Father, he is saying he is the fulfillment of the promises, the fidelity, the righteousness, the graciousness, the truth of God in the Semitic sense. This also makes immediate sense of the way and the life. For just as when we call a friend true, we are not simply referring to a belief the friend has, but are referring to the lived out way, the lived out way of the friend's life, the life of the friend, Jesus is referring to the way of his life. To be a Christian, then, is to be true to Jesus in this sense, to live the way of Jesus Christ, the life of Jesus Christ, the truth of Jesus Christ, which is to live out gracious love, which in Jesus' context of empire and radical inequity and injustice meant speaking love to power on behalf of the poor. Um, and this recognition comes through the history of the teachings of the church in dialogue with scripture, that is, from theology, orthodoxy which is in a dialectical relation with orthopractice. And of course, when, when Gutierrez says this, what he means is he's speaking of a, of a, of a, uh, as a Catholic, but again, in a way that could also be understood by a president, where you, you, you are um, looking for intersubjective confirmation, not just a, uh, your own understanding, but looking to how the entire church has witnessed to this being what uh, the message of Jesus is about. This is the context within which Gutierrez defines being a follower of Jesus Christ, uh, the Christian life, not in terms of belief, but above all else in terms of a following of Jesus Christ. 
All this ex also explains the tight connection Gutierrez draws between praxis and faith, which is above all a life lived in fidelity to Jesus Christ. So praxis implies for Gutierrez, and for Gutierrez this is praxis, praxis in a particularly Christian sense, praxis implies a transformative activity uh, that is influenced and illumined by Christian love. Quoting there, of course. In a context of inequality and poverty, being true to Jesus Christ, fidelity to Jesus Christ, that praxis will be a liberating practice, praxis grounded in solidarity with the poor. Quoting again, liberating praxis, therefore, to the degree that it starts out from an authentic solidarity with the poor and oppressed, is, in short, a praxis of love. Any attempt to separate love of God for love of neighbor gives rise to attitudes which impoverish in one way or another. And of course, the, the parable of the sheep and the goats in Matthew 25 is at the forefront of his mind here. Now, does this perhaps mean, Gutierrez asked rhetorically, that faith is reduced to works? Uh, no, he replies. And, and here again, facing the same criticism that we saw was launched against Wesley, he makes a move virtually identical to Wesley. Uh, he cites James to explain faith in Jesus Christ in terms of fidelity, truth in the Semitic sense, um, is to explain why faith without works is dead. Um, and that's where he cites James. Finally, uh, we should stress in reaction to the commonplace uh, religion, um, in particular with its belief in heaven, is the opium of the people, right? So Marx's idea that that made people... Um, have no energy for thinking about social justice in the presence. All their hopes were put up in heaven. Um, and if you put your hope in heaven, then you're not going to care about this world. It's all going to go up there. Um, and, and so this is a this is a trope which is commonplace, especially um, in more elite uh, circles. And so it's important that Gutierrez takes the time to say explicitly that it is important also to observe that in liberation theology, uh, the subject of orthopraxis is studied in the context of the role played by eschatology in contemporary theology. The context is important because this perspective opens us to the gift that gives ultimate meaning to history, the full and definitive encounter with the Lord and with other humans. Uh, note the resonance of this with Wesley's, best of all, God is with us. But here again, as with Wesley, this does not mean there's not a literal uh, belief in life after death. Uh, the, quoting again, the emphasis on historical practice is therefore con directly connected uh, with the Christian affirmation of a world beyond the present life. Um, and to say again, in reality, concretely, people who are oppressed, it turns out, have no difficulty believing in a literal heaven um, and also having ample energy um, left over to be concerned about social injustices that are confronting them. And that is the end of part one of Major Theological Themes. Uh, I made this a bit shorter, so it would be a bit more manageable. Uh, there's a lot more to come, um, and that'll be, but another equally short, I think, uh, part two, which I hope we'll have out uh, for you in a couple of days.